Okay, so we've we've got a goodly number of people with us already this evening. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Carol Suter, and I'm the Master of St. Cross College. And I'm delighted to have everybody uh, with us this evening for what's going to be a fascinating panel discussion. I thought I might just start by uh, explaining a little bit about St. Cross. It's just possible that you haven't all checked in advance what St. Cross is and who we are. So we're one of the more recent graduate colleges of the University of Oxford, established in 1965. We have well over 600 students studying topics uh, ranging right across the university's areas of, of work. Um, all of our students are postgraduates. They come to us from across the world and we have alumni in over 100 countries. We are a completely international college and we pride ourselves on being international, egalitarian, multidisciplinary and cross-disciplinary. So for us, this sort of panel discussion, bringing people together from different perspectives, different corners, uh, to talk about a particular topic is absolutely unique to us. And it's what we always hear back from our alumni when we talk to them from across the world. What's the thing you miss most? Admittedly, they might say the food first, but after that, it will always be the conversations over meals, the opportunity to discuss with people from different backgrounds and different perspectives any topic you care to choose and know that there will be an interesting perspective and uh, real difference uh, of, of, of perspectives that are brought to the issue. So it's a great joy to be able to bring um, our students together, our alumni together, and then to be able to host this sort of event when we have a range of speakers with different backgrounds. And of course, um, I cannot fail to thank um, our fellow Professor Rana Nissa who uh, helped suggest that this would be a good way of doing things. And of course, our own team here, who have done all of the arrangements behind the scenes. So we're going to hand the baton from one to another this evening. Uh, and I'm going to bow out quietly and leave the experts to do the talking later on. But I'd like to begin um, by introducing Professor Ricardo Suarez de Oliveira, who's Professor of the International Politics of Africa at the Department of um, Politics and International Relations here in Oxford and a fellow of St Peter's College. He's co-editor of the Journal of the Royal African Society called African Affairs and co-director of the Oxford Martin School's programme on African governance. Um, Ricardo is going to lead us into the topic in the discussion. I'm delighted to be able to hand over to him now. Okay. Thank you and hello, good evening. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today and I wanted to start by thanking St Cross College and the Master Carol Souter for kindly hosting this event around Simon Cooper's The Happy Traitor, the extraordinary story of George Blake. Thank you also to the technical team. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Simon Cooper. Uh, Simon is a columnist for the Weekend uh, Financial Times. Uh, Simon's of South African origin, but was partly raised in Holland, uh, studied at Oxford and at Harvard before joining <clears throat> FT. Um, Simon celebrated work uh, as a sports writer, including books such as Soccernomics challenged the genre with a sensibility that is historically attuned as well as ethnographically minded and benefits to my mind from a degree of lucidity and detachment that is extremely rare in the field. This insider outsider sensibility partly accounts for Simon's consistently perceptive writings on uh, topics as variegated as Dutch culture, Paris where he has lived for two decades, Germany and many others. Uh, for more than a decade, in addition to his sports writing career, Simon's weekly columns have discussed urbanism, changes in popular culture, books, and much else, including most recently, our own university's putative role as incubator of Brexit in the person of the prime minister and his 1980s undergraduate colleagues. Simon's book, um, The Happy Traitor, has a, an interesting, very fascinating genesis. Uh, Simon, through a a Dutch-based contact in um, Moscow, managed an extremely rare interview with George Blake. Uh, I assume this was George Blake's last interview, but also one of the few significant interviews he will have given over um, the decades. Um, over about three hours uh, in 2012, Simon was able to converse uh, with this uh, remarkably charming, but also very elusive, very evasive man, uh, and what the bo book does, it builds on that encounter, but it's much more than that. It is a truly remarkable 
uh, work of, of uh, research um, with a lot of sources, including perhaps the most obviously surprising ones are videos of George Blake's lectures uh, to the Stasi uh, in the late 70s, the early 80s in East Germany. Um, and he follows the remarkably peripatetic life of Blake, his Dutch Jewish origins, his adolescence in Egypt, his work with the Dutch resistance, and finally his recruiting uh, by the predecessor of the MI6 uh, um, before he was interned as a POW in um, uh, North Korea in the early 50s, at which moment uh, not only did George Blake turn um, a, a spy for uh, the Eastern Bloc, uh, but he became the most prolific, perhaps the most prolific uh, spy which the Soviet Union had uh, in a major Western uh, spy agency during that period. Until he was finally caught in 1961, um, Blake will have passed on thousands of documents and most importantly, he will have made available to the Soviets the names of hundreds of, um, of Russian, of uh, Western um, uh, spies uh, in the Eastern Bloc, at least 40 of whom, and Simon deals with this with a, a lot of, um, uh, he doesn't evade this question, <clears throat> 40 of whom will have been um, executed. Um, he was then arrested but managed a remarkable escape uh, to Russia in 1966, uh, at which time he would uh, have a much more discreet career uh, in, in Russian uh, research um, until uh, the Boxing Day, Boxing Day of 2020, when he died at the age of um, 98. Um, and Simon uh, had the book ready and was able to publish the book within uh, five weeks of uh, Blake's, um, of Blake's uh, uh, passing away. Um, I won't go into the details of the book and most importantly I won't go into uh, the, the many extraordinary dimensions uh, that we will be discussing um, in greater uh, detail with, with the other speakers. Suffice it to say that I thought the book was an absolutely compelling read um, and one point I would make before passing on the, 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 the giving the floor to Rana Mitter is I thought the book was pitch perfect in terms of its ambivalence. Simon has deep misgivings about the human toll of Blake's betrayal, but also doubts whether uh, he can properly be called a traitor for the reasons which we will no doubt explore. He finds him absolutely charming. And the interview is laced with a great deal of Dutch bonding. The, the interview that uh, Simon had with Blake, a lot of Dutch camaraderie, um, and at a crucial point, Simon even seems to commit himself to sending a package of Dutch uh, culinary delights. Uh, I'd like to see what's in that Dutch package, but nonetheless, um, Simon seems to be inclined to do so. But crucially, on his return to Paris with more than enough time to think about um, um, this ambivalent, complex character, Simon does not send the package of Dutch food to Blake and most importantly, doesn't uh, let himself be weaved by the charm of this um, extraordinary uh, and complicated character. As Rana, over to you. Ricardo, thank you very much indeed for giving us such a splendid introduction to the uh, the book. And before we go on, just a reminder, or a reminder of information, if you don't already have it, that if you're intrigued by what you hear today, you can buy a discounted version of The Happy Traitor. All you have to do is go to the web page of the book on the St. Cross um, web page, so the one that you use to register to, to come here. If you look on there, you'll see that there is a link to Blackwell's Bookshop. And or, even, or a phone number to call them. And if you basically give them the information that it's come through uh, this uh, source, then you'll get a discount on your copy. So we do recommend that you do that if you want to find out more. But before we get to all that, I think it's time for our conversation to start. And Simon has very kindly agreed to be interrogated, not quite George Blake style, I hope, but nonetheless, uh, both in a friendly and rigorous style by the three of us here today. And to start us off, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Helen Fry. Um, Helen is a very considerable historian in her own right. She has written on the 10,000 Germans who fought for Britain during World War II, that's for Britain, note, as well as writing on spies, intelligence, and prisoners of war. Her books include, <coughs> excuse me, MI9, A History of the Secret Service for Escape and Invasion, and The Walls Have Ears, which is about 
bugging the Nazis during World War II. Uh, she's an ambassador for the Museum of Military Intelligence, a trustee of the Med Menem Collection, and president of the Friends of the National Archives. And I should say, Helen, I guess at this moment, the archives really do need friends since, of course, the pandemic has hit them hard, like many other places uh, as well. I'm going to hand over now to Helen, who knows this book very well, and ask if she would lead us off with a series of, of questions to, to Simon and begin our conversation. And then the rest of us will come back in. One last note I should add also, please use the chat function uh, to send in any questions that you might have. And in the last part of our discussion today, there'll be plenty of time for you, our audience, I think from around the world, in fact, to throw questions to Simon about George Blake and the book as well. But we'll start with Helen, Dr. Helen Fry, over to you, please. Thank you very much and for the warm welcome. And I agree with Professor Ricardo. I mean, this book is so compelling. And Simon and I have chatted already and uh, knows I'm a great fan. So congratulations. And I heartily encourage you to buy the book, everyone. I want to start with that interview because, of course, that is at the heart of the book. And as Ricardo was saying, you are probably the last, one of the last Western journalists ever to have interviewed George Blake. I mean, that's incredible. Can you tell us how that interview came about? Because something very special is not with the Dutch connection. It's not that easy to get to Blake. No, it's not. Thank you, Helen. It's very intimidating to be interrogated by three people much more erudite than me. It's a bit like Blake's interrogation in 1961 by his uh, colleagues in MI6, which was also quite gentlemanly in Oxford spirit. And thank you to St. Cross for hosting. Getting to Blake, I mean, I'd read about him. I remember vividly in 1999, I was visiting a friend in Amsterdam. I read a Dutch magazine about a story about this amazing man who, you know, was a British KGB agent, but really he was Dutch. And the journalist interviewed him and I thought, I'm going to do that one day. I'm going to find this man, George Blake, and interview him. And I'd been to Moscow various times. When I went in 2012, I contacted a Dutch friend of mine, Derek Sauer, who's a kind of media magnus in Moscow. He's now owner of the New York Times, of the Moscow Times, sorry. And he created uh, Russian Cosmopolitan, Russian Playboy after the, uh, after the Glasnost. And Derek was friendly with Blake. And so Derek put it to Blake and Blake was interested. You know, I was going to interview him for a Dutch newspaper. And so Blake wanted to interview me first because, you know, spies are pretty careful people. So I was walking around this Moscow graveyard looking for the graves of Chekhov and Khrushchev and my phone goes. And this man says to me in Dutch in a sort of pre-war chic Rotterdam accent, um, George Blake here. And so we have a very pleasant, polite chat. You know, he is a very, um, he was a very kind of easygoing, chatty person in my experience. And I know that, that his problem, his anxiety, is that he wants to ask me, are you gonna ask me about Putin? Because Blake didn't wanna be asked about Putin because he loathed and despised Putin. He thought this cynical, violent KGB regime, oddly was not to his taste because Blake at heart was a peace loving Democrat. Weird as that may sound, certainly an old age. And I said, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you about contemporary Russian politics, I want to ask you about your life. So he invited me to his dacha. And the agreement was I would only write this for a Dutch newspaper because Blake said, you know, this was conveyed to me subtly by him, but more clearly by Sauer. His ex-wife and his three sons live in Britain and they didn't like it when stories about Daddy the KGB agents appeared in the British press. But Blake was very happy for it to be written about in Holland. He'd left Holland 70, 70 years before. He was quite nostalgic about the country. And um, so that was a goer. So this started as just a newspaper interview, um, just to be published in Dutch. And that was the plan. And I walked out the door of his Dutch three hours later, thinking, I've been a journalist for a long time, but that is the most interesting interview that I've ever done. I really think that there might be more here than a newspaper article. But my children were very small at the time. I had no time. My entire weekend was taken up all the time. So I just wrote a Dutch newspaper article and tried to put it out of my head. Until a couple of years later, I thought this really should be a book. Then, just to finish this, I begged permission from Derek Sauer. I said, look, you know, it wasn't going to be published in English, but mm -hmm. I think this should be a book. And Derek said, publish when Blake dies, because then his family will have to deal with a wave of publicity anyway. It won't really matter if you're past that wave. So wait until he dies. So that was the agreement and that was conveyed to Blake by Derek. Blake knew this book was coming, but I think in his old age, he had kind of lost interest in those things. He wasn't very interested in his reputation or what people thought of him. 
So how did you actually find him? I mean, him, him as a man, I mean, he was charming, wasn't he? I mean, what was it like that day of the interview? Well, it must I, have been a surprise. Yeah, I mean, I read his autobiography, I read a bit about him, so I was, you know, semi-informed, as journalists are, usually. And so I arrive in this suburb outside Moscow, it's Saturday morning, there's quite a lot of traffic jams, as people who know Moscow will know. And I walk down this wooded lane, it's like being somewhere in Surrey, actually. And this little old man with a little dog and a cane with a dog's head is waiting for me in the lane. It's like a, it's like a rendezvous in a Le Carre novel. And he pushes through this door and we enter this garden of this wooden dacha, uh, painted green. And Blake, we're speaking in Dutch, and Blake says to me, this dacha, you would not believe it, is pre-revolutionary. And it is a very large garden. It is like being in, a, in the home county somewhere. And uh, we sit down on the sofa, he was nearly 90, and he's almost blind at this point. And he said, I can see that somebody is sitting next to me, but who that person is, what he looks like, I cannot see. And I said, look, you know, do you want to speak English or Dutch? And he said, I so rarely get the chance to speak Dutch, it would be a pleasure for me. So we spoke Dutch. And so, yeah, from the start, he was um, likable. He was able to reflect. He didn't immediately shut down questions. He wasn't just doing self-justification all the time. And it was, it was more conversational, I would say, than an interview. So did you get a sense, because perhaps it was a key question maybe in your mind, or was it a key question? Did you get any sense of why he did what he did? Because that must be one of the questions that we're left with. Why did he do what he did? And, and as we know, um, potentially hundreds of agents lost their lives as a result of his betrayals. I mean, there's a, there's a theory in Blake writing that he hated England because as a half Jewish foreigner, he was rejected by the snobs in SIS. And so he was taking revenge on the class system. Now, I'm sure they did, did see him as an outsider and they didn't see him as one of us, etc. But he didn't really mind that. He never saw himself as particularly British. And, um, you know, his patriotism was much more Dutch. The reason he did it was he was an idealist. He had grown up a very devout Calvinist, which is quite a common phenomenon in pre-war Netherlands, planning to become a Calvinist pastor. And then after, you know, 1945, SIS sent him to the liberated Netherlands and then to occupied Germany. And for British intelligence officers at the time, there was a lot of kind of um, partying, uh, wine, women, and, uh, you know, occupied country houses and he felt that he had um, behaved badly he had not lived like a pastor should and therefore he uh, he'd lost his vocation he couldn't become a pastor anymore and at this point SIS offers him this you know new career in inspiring spying really against the Soviet Union so he stops being so Calvinistic but he remains in search of an ideal and while he's in Korea during the Korean War, he's there as an intelligence officer, the North Koreans imprison him, goes on this terrible death march. He has two years sitting in a farmhouse um, where he's given Marx to read in Russian. And he thinks, well, I might die here like so many people, and I want to die for a cause. And the cause that I've come to believe in, he thinks, is communism. So he, so I said to him, really, you transferred your Calvinism into communism. And I thought he would say, no, it's not like that at all. It's much more complicated. And he said, yeah, that's exactly what I did. And I said, was your communism a faith like your Christianity was? And he said, yeah, I think it was. My, my final question that I hand on to someone else is really, there's been, there have been comments, I mean, you've had some fantastic reviews, but there has been a comment that you've been too kind to Blake. You found him charming. Did he charm you? Have you been too kind to him in the book? Or do you feel you've actually got to the heart of, of him and that we've got a new understanding of him? I think that we journalists are very susceptible to being charmed because, you know, we, I think in comparison to academics, who I know is a species as well, academics are often people who want to read a book by themselves in a room. And then they, they're taken out of that and they're forced to interact with students and do administration, etc. But I think that's the profile that gets attracted to it. Journalists, journalism tends to be attracted to people who want to go out and talk to lots of people. So we tend to be quite sociable and, as I say, easily charmed by nice people, which is a, which is a problem. And I think that if I'd sat down, <coughs> excuse me, the evening 
of the interview and written an article or tried to start writing the book, I would have been too positive about him. Mm -hmm. I think that the effects of years and years of reading about him and, you know, I, I was not a historian of espionage in any way, not like you. So I really had to ground myself in this very complex field. So it was a lot of reading. And I think by the end of it, I've tried to give a fair account of Blake as a man who did terrible things. Mm -hmm. But he's not a man that I managed to hate all through. I mean, I think he was a well-meaning man who became a de facto serial killer. And the other thing is that I think some of the reviews that make that point that you say, and I, I respect that, I think are driven by a kind of British patriotism that I also don't quite feel. So for some of, some, let's say more conservative historians, Blake is a criminal because he betrayed Britain. And that's just not how I am programmed to feel. I feel Blake was a criminal because he, he sent many people to their deaths. Mm. But the treachery aspects of it is not something that, uh, bothers me morally so much. Helen, thanks very much indeed. And um, we're going to come back and I would actually ask both of my other panelists during this, this session, if they want to use the raise hand function or some other means just to come back into the conversation or even just you know, dip back in, then feel very free to, to do that because I know that there's plenty more to, to ask. I'm going to hand over back to Ricardo at this point because I know that you've got some thoughts that you'd like to put to Simon as well. So Ricardo, over to you. Thanks, Rana. Um, Simon, this question chimes very much with the, Helen's last question, which has to do with the differences between um, Blake and the, the infamous Cambridge Five in terms of class, in, term, in terms of his cosmopolitanism, um, the fact that he converted to communism in the 50s, not in the 30s, uh, and as you noted, that he was never considered one of us. Uh, so my question is, uh, did his embrace of communism have anything to do with his rejection by the British establishment as a half Jewish foreigner? Um, how do you see his case in the context of the, the more uh, famous uh, British, properly British traitors? I think if you look at the Cambridge Five, as you point out, they become communists in the 1930s when they feel there is terrible inequality in Britain, which they're on the right side of, but that inequality radicalizes them. And above all, that fascism needs to be fought and Britain and France are too lily liver, liver to do it. So the only people really willing to stand up to the fascists at the time they feel are the communists. And so it becomes partly a moral choice, but also, of course, it's terrifically exciting. And Blake says, look, that's a motivation for any spy, the, you know, the thrill-seeking aspect, which for someone like Guy Burgess or Philby, I think, is a, is a very fundamental part. I mean, Blake got to know Philby in Moscow and Donald McLean, and he distinguished them as Philby being interested in power, and the kind of the KGB is the ultimate secret society that it was very glamorous to belong to. And McLean, like Blake, was a Protestant idealist who had embraced communism for out of idealistic reasons. So, I mean, that's a big differentiator. Did Blake hate Britain? No. I mean, in 1950-51, when he converts to communism, you know, it's a step on the end of the step on a long road in North Korea. He has very limited experience of Britain. He arrives in Britain mid-war 1943. He's fled from ne the Netherlands where he was a courier in the Dutch resistance through Belgium and France and Spain. And somehow he's got to Britain. Joined the Secret Service. He's very proud of being part of the British war effort. He admires kind of British stoicism in World War II. Uh, he's very pro-British, but he's not British. He doesn't feel that. Uh, his father was a Constantinople Jew, who'd fought for Britain in World War I and had become a uh, British citizen. So the ties to Britain are very, uh, are very weak. And really what drove him in the war was anti-Nazism, never a kind of British patriotism. And so at the point that he converts, he barely knows Britain. And the longest stretch that he'll ever spend in Britain in his life is his five years in Wormwood Scrubs from 1961. And so... You know, yes, in MI6, you know, they thought he had a funny accent and he uh, had rather odd foreign habits. But, you know, I think most people sort of liked him. And he, he wasn't really seeking to become one of us. He didn't really need a role in the class system. Which is part of his defense that he was never a traitor because he never belonged. Yeah, I mean, that is uh, a quote from Philby, which has also been attributed to Blake. So I'm not entirely sure whether... Um, what the origins of that are, but certainly that was his attitude. He never belonged in Britain. He was always a um, 
an outsider, but he was happy to be an outsider. I mean, Blake's whole life, from the age of 13, when he goes, he sent to Cairo after his father's death, he sent to the father's sister in Cairo to live in a mansion there. His whole life is really entering a succession of foreign environments, whether it's uh, Berlin or Korea or London or Moscow, and finding his feet, adapting. You know, I think by the end, he spoke six languages very well. And, um, you know, I recognize that as well as a kind of cosmopolitan uh, raised British and Jewish in the Netherlands. I recognized um, his adaptability of which he was very proud. And that adaptability is not about seeking to belong, it's seeking to, um, to find a place. Simon, I wonder if you can quickly address a parallel. For me, one of the most fascinating chapters in the book is the chapter about uh, who, someone who is improbably George Blake's cousin, Henri Curiel, who became one of the founders of the Egyptian um, uh, Communist Party before being assassinated in the 1970s in, in, in Paris. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I'm thinking about a whole generation of quote unquote outsiders who ended up being really important in the late colonial anti-imperialist mobilization um, in the 40s, 50s, 60s and beyond. From that perspective, George Blake um, looks very different. Can you tell us a little bit about Curiel and the parallels there? Yeah, the reason I wrote a whole chapter about Curiel is that all the writings about Blake are British, almost all, and they inevitably draw that parallel with the Cambridge Five. He only meets the Cambridge Five when he arrives in Moscow, he meets two of them, and they're not really his peers. His, as you say, he belongs much more in the kind of uh, roll call of... I, let's let, yeah, communists in colonial countries. So he and Curiel, he moves into this mansion in 1936, the Curie, Villa Curiel, where Henri Curiel and Raoul Curiel are the brothers, the father is a banker, and it's a fantabulous place. Uh, it's now the Algerian embassy in Cairo, the Curiel brothers donated it to the Algerian freedom struggle. And it's in Zamalek, you know, the most uh, posh neighborhood in Cairo. And they had 10 or so servants, which was quite modest by the standards of the time. So he's living in extreme wealth, cheek by jowl with the terrible poverty of Egypt in the 30s, which is bound to radicalize uh, both the poor and the rich. So he and Curiel separately on their paths become communists. Uh, not while Blake was living there. At the time, Blake was a sort of very Calvinist schoolboy. And if you, uh, if you follow their trajectories, both also ending up spending the last 20 years or so of their life trying to uh, solve this Israeli-Palestinian problem, it's remarkably similar. And I think part of that was seeing themselves as Jews who had lived happily in Arab lands. And then the Kuneos, uh, the remaining Kuneos were kind of um, forced out of Egypt after the 48 war and who wanted to reconcile Arabs and Jews. So that's this kind of passion, this side of Blake that we don't see if we think of him as a, um, a figure in, uh, in the British drama. I mean, I, let me ask you, you know that period of the kind of late colonial outsider much better. Who, who, who did you think of when you read that? I'm thinking of virtually every major uh, late colonial liberation movement, um, sometimes politically radical, sometimes merely uh, um, movements that want national independence um, and little else. But all of them have a cast of um, outsider characters uh, that is really, really significant. We actually have a colleague at Oxford who's written recently a book about this, Nick Owen. Uh, I think it's really, 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 uh, it opens up a whole different dimension of comparison. He looks entirely different to my mind from that perspective. And I mean this not from a normative perspective. He, he still is at the end of the day, the sort of political serial killer that you described him to be. So this is not a value judgment, but it's, it's a very exciting angle to make sense of Blake's trajectory. Uh, Simon, if I may, there's an aspect here having to do with, with the Middle East that I, I wanted to, to, to raise, which recurs at least twice in the book. Um, you, you discuss the parallels between Blake's idealism and contemporary jihadis. Uh, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about that. Well, I mean, as you know, Ricardo, I live in Paris. I'm speaking to you from Paris. And my cycle route to my little office every day. It takes me past the Bataclan, the music hall where the massacre is the main massacre of the 2015 terrorist attacks happened. So that was very much on my mind, those jihadis, while I was writing the book, let's say in the years from about 2015. And 
I think that uh, the parallel is very strong because Blake, like the jihadis, is this young man who feels he's living this immoral life. He needs to find seriousness in the cause. And he finds on offer this promise of a paradise, not in the next world, but in, in this world that can be achieved through this ideal. For him, it's communism. And for them, it's sort of ISIS's um, creation of the caliphate uh, on, this, on this earth. And killing in the service of this ideal is so wonderful that killing in its service is okay. You sort of have to do it. It's, it's right and moral to do it. And so it's also a way to purify yourself. You know, you're unhappy with your own life, which seems rather empty and uh, perhaps you've been partying too much. And so this will set you straight, this embrace of the ideal. And reading it, I mean, writing this book for me is, a, it, the book has become partly a story about the dangers of idealism, a bit like, you know, poor man's version of The Quiet American, where, um, you know, we're members of Generation X, I think um, most of us here. And luckily for us, there was no ideal on offer. Uh, there, there was no perfect world on offer in politics. We came after the generation that was tempted by communism. And so Generation X is always dismissed understandably as cynical and um, uh, not true believers in anything, but thank God for that. Simon, I'll pass you uh, to, to Rana, but I just have one last related question to that. Um, you uh, emphasize this ideological dimension, whether it's his overt embrace of communism or his deeper Calvinist roots, you, 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 you favor that um, interpretation. But there seems to be elements here that are extra ideological and which you, or even non-idealist, and which you yourself emphasize elsewhere in the book. The fact that he wants to be part of something important isn't there a bit of narcissism? Isn't there a bit of self-importance here as well on his part? Yeah, I mean, look, every conversion has multiple factors and some are psychological and some are ideological. And, you know, at the point when he converts, he, he's a rootless figure, he's a failed spy, his mission and career is not worked out at all. He's lost his vocation, losing his vocation as a British spy. He has lost his first fatherland, the Netherlands, has become disillusioned with his second fatherland, Britain. So, of course, there's a, there's a casting about. And he himself says, look, the, the, the thrill of spying, of undercover work, is part of it. It's not just that you do it for pure reasons. And I think what makes Blake unusual is that at an even younger age than the Cambridge Five, he has become used to living undercover, to being a courier in the resistance from the age of about 18, 19. In Holland. In Holland. I mean, deception becomes daily work for him and he finds that he's good at it. So, you know, spying is kind of his, um, his new vocation. Rana? Ricardo, thank you so much for a great set of questions and Helen too. And don't forget both of you, please feel free to jump back in if you want to. And everyone, we already see that lots of questions are coming in and we will make sure that those get to Simon as well. But I want to just follow up on a couple of um, other things, I mean, there's so much to, to enjoy in the book and also so much to be to be amazed by. Could I ask, because actually you do dedicate a chapter to this as well, it's something some of the reviews have mentioned, and I think it's morally important. Could you say something about the victims? I mean, as you said more than once, this is someone who sends, I mean, the, the newspaper headlines after he's arrested said 40 people, but actually it's more like hundreds of people to their deaths. Could you pick just maybe one or two people who almost certainly died as a result of Blake's actions and just tell us a bit about them? Uh, well, an SAS calculation seems to be that he, and Blake's also, was that he betrayed the names of hundreds of agents, of whom about 40 were killed, because the communists post-Stalin were less bloodthirsty than they'd been before. So a lot of these people were thrown into jail, etc., which is also a pretty horrible face. Uh, let's take a man called uh, Robert Bialek, I think he was, who was an East German, who um, was a principled anti-communist. And he um, makes the mistake of uh, deciding that the revolution, this is an anti-Nazi, he sympathizes with the communists, and then he decides that the communist revolution has gone wrong and something should be done. And so he's this completely principled guy. He uh, goes off to West Berlin, but from there keeps broadcasting anti-East German stuff. So the belief is that Blake gave his name to the East German, to the Soviets who gave us the East Germans. One night at a party in West Berlin, Bialik has a drink and collapses. The drink has been spiked. 
two guys say, don't worry, he's our mate, he's a bit drunk. And Bialik by this point has locked himself in the bathroom knowing that things are going horribly wrong. These guys take him out, call a taxi and say, don't say to the other guests, don't worry, we'll take Robert home to sober up. He disappears in a taxi and is never seen again, believed to have been tortured and killed in East Germany. So that is an example with a name. Examples without a name, uh, one MI6 officer who ran operations into Russia, which often involved uh, emigrants, emigres, refugees from the Soviet Union who were anti-Soviet. He would send these people back into the Soviet Union with, on missions. And, you know, maybe you were Lithuanian or Ukrainian and you would be dropped by night in a little boat or a parachute. And what this man, this MI6 officer discovered over time is that they would immediately be picked up. The Soviets were waiting for them and they were never heard of again. Uh, he was an MI6 officer called Frank, Frank Bicknell. So he realizes over time these people were betrayed and they were betrayed by Blake. In fact, the details of his operations later appear in the Soviet press because Blake has given them to the KGB, which has given them to the Soviet press. So these are many unnamed young Soviet emigres who die and uh, their names, you know, their MI6 file is closed. This, the KGB files are now closed. Their names may never be known. So that leads me quite naturally to my, my next question. Uh, and I have to say this is prompted actually by the cover of your book. I promise I have read the inside of it and not just the cover. But I should say, for those who haven't seen it, the cover has a endorsement from no, few, no less a person than John le Carre. I, I would point out, Simon, you interviewed George Blake and then he died. You interviewed John le Carre, I've got a statement from him, and then he died. Could I say, please don't ever interview me. But um, what John le Carre says, and he says rightly the book is different, valuable, humane, informative, but it's actually the back cover quote that I found intriguing. He says, if the definition of a psychopath is someone who refuses to accept the consequences of his actions, does George fit the definition? There he sits, admitting it was all for nothing, but has no regrets, or does he? And then in your book, just to prove I have actually read it, there's a bit where you talk about talking in Dutch, where there's a sort of element of grammar, where it seems that Blake has said something in Dutch that says, I regret everything. And then you think actually what he was saying was, there's a lot of things that I regret. It's not, not quite, the, quite mm. the same. Regret, regret, regret. This is the, the thing that keeps, keeps coming back. What do you think? Did he regret? Well, firstly, on Le Carre, my hands are clean. Uh, I never actually met Le Carre, but I am friendly with Philippe Sands, who is a neighbour of Le Carre's in Hampstead, of course. And Philippe kindly got the books of Le Carre. Le Carre seems to have read it, wrote an email about it, which is very nice. And I was kind of bugging Philippe, can I use the email as a quote? Can I use it as a quote? And then Le Carre died. And so we got permission from his agent to use most of the, the emails as a quote. So that's the story. I, I never met him. On did George regret? I mean, I asked him this question and he said, um, there are so many things I regret. Or he actually said, ik heb spijt van alles. I won't go into the complexities, but I think he really meant there are many things I regret. And he said, I regret the pain I caused my ex-wife and my sons. You know, his British wife is left with three small boys uh, and a husband in Wormwood Scrubs who um, she'll never live with again. The, um, he said he regrets the pain he caused to his ex-colleagues. He actually fi felt quite guilty towards his colleagues at MI6 whom he liked and respected. And whereas Philby in his uh, autobiography sort of mocks his colleagues, Blake doesn't and actually uh, doesn't seem to break the official secrets act in his biography, which is very strange, his autobiography. Um, did he regret the agents? I think he coped psychologically by living in denial. His, uh, he didn't like the fact that he had participated in killing people and he had told the KGB, I think he really had, look, you can protect the Soviet Union, but you mustn't hurt these people whose names I'm gonna give you. Now, of course, that's fantastically naive because the KGB, if they caught a uh, tracer in mid-Cold War, did not give that person community service. So um, he must have known that these people were going to be hurt, killed, but he didn't, he wasn't able to accept that. So he coped, I think, psychologically by living in denial about it. Well, if I could add off the back of that, actually, a question that's come in from John Nandris, uh, and actually I'll start feeding in some of the really interesting audience questions that are, that are coming in. Uh, he's phrased this, actually, you've phrased this, John, in a rather interesting way. Idealist to Calvinist to communist. Fake? Yes. 
did he really think that, quote, my sins are not my fault? And that's if you're getting the idea of, which you brought up earlier, the idea of, you know, Calvinism and communism being a conversion of one thing to the to the other, which you said that he, he, he would have accepted. Is the word sin kind of, you know, it's a very Christian sort of concept. Is that something that he would have uh, accepted as, as a way of thinking about this? Blake, very early on in life, I dispute that his Calvinism or communism were fake. Blake, very early in life as a child, embraced this very fundamentalist, hardcore version of, com of Calvinism, which was that everything is predestined. There is no free will. You know, um, God has made us and he shapes everything we do. And therefore, we're not responsible for our actions in his version of, um, of human agency. We, we, we're just instruments of God, like the clay made by the potter. And so that, of course, was very uh, reassuring for him, you know, having done terrible things. He could always say to himself, look, you know, it wasn't really me who did it. Uh, I, I was just a vessel of God, and I have been used both for good and for evil purposes, but by God. So I think he both genuinely believed it, and it was psychologically very convenient for him. His childhood belief in predestination stayed with him throughout life. And his autobiography, which he wrote at the age of about 70, is called No Other Choice, which is kind of most fundamental worldview. Good. And on to that question that actually comes uh, from uh, Mark Hornwell, um, which is, you've said that, you know, in, in some sense, ideologically, he's loyal, loyal to, to communism uh, as, as an idea, a kind of ideal world, which, which never really came off. Would he have said he was loyal to the Soviet Union, which, of course, is not quite the same thing? I mean, the Soviet Union is no longer with us. He outlived both the British Empire and the Soviet one. And so he, he, had both, he had that traumatic experience. And he, I don't think, I mean, he, there's a complexity. He goes to Cambridge like the others, but only for a year on a kind of sandwich course in 1947-48 to study Russian. And falls in love, not so much with the Soviet Union as with Russian, with the language and with Orthodox Christianity, which he, he finds the service is very beautiful. In old age, he had Orthodox icons on his walls. And so he starts to transfer his patriotism towards Russia. So he falls for a kind of older version of Russia, which becomes commingled with communism. I mean, he arrives in the Soviet Union under Brezhnev at the end of 1966. It's a very hard place to love. And he realizes within a week that Soviet that communism doesn't work. So he, he's able to move on kind of emotionally in that way. That's intriguing to me, actually, that he was so he took against Putin so much, because, of course, one of the things that's true about Putin, it seems that his attachment to any kind of ideological communism, if it was ever there, has long since gone. But his attachment to the sort of symbolism of orthodox Russia seems to be to be very strong. And yet you said that Blake really didn't take to Putin. I think he saw Putin as a cynic. I think Blake thought that idealism was a wonderful and beautiful thing. And so he said he was happy that he had you know, done everything he had done to serve communism, because even though communism had failed, it was an experiment that might serve humanity in centuries to come, sort of like the Jacob Rees-Mogg view of Brexit. So he believed very strongly that it was important to have ideals. And in Putin, he saw nothing. Um, I have to say also there was one thing, that, one of many things that was very intriguing about the uh, Curiel chapter, which was that uh, I have to say uh, on one half of my family, we actually have quite a lot of Curiels. Uh, I know that it's not an, uh, a, a unique name, but it's not that common either. So I shall have to do some family digging and see if there's anything going on there that we, we need to, to find out about. You know, yeah, yeah. Indeed, we'll get back to volume two if, uh, if, 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 if so. One of the sort of portraits, pen portraits, really, that struck me as um, fascinating, poignant, rather sad, really, was something you've alluded to briefly, which is the fact that there is this sort of ghost community, I suppose, of ex-agents who lived in Moscow after they'd been, you know, rendered or escaped and, and headed over to the Soviet Union. I mean, Donald McLean until, Donald, Donald McLean, one of the Cambridge Five, died, I think, in 1983, and there's an account there, I mean, obviously from before your, your work, but of, uh, George Blake uh, seeing and, and hearing about the, uh, the, 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 that particular death. What was your sense of that sort of afterlife community as it were? Because he was actually quite active in the Soviet Union for, for decades after, after he got there. Yeah, he, well. he and McLean worked for this rather pointless think tank called IMEMO, which was a kind of, you know, Soviet Council of Foreign Relations, where they wrote learned papers about, so McLean actually wrote quite a respected book about British foreign policy from the Soviet Union, which I believe was published in Britain. And um, 
So Blake, Blake is invited by McLean to become a kind of uh, Arabic expert uh, in MMO and they potter about, nobody works very hard, nobody really pays any attention to the stuff they publish. I think- At most universities, in other words. Possibly, but uh, yeah, I was gonna say less well paid, but yes, less well paid, yeah. Um, now, I think the key difference between the, the traitors who had a happy afterlife and those who didn't was adaptability. So Blake was rather contemptuous of Philby, who he saw as a British gentleman who didn't understand uh, Russian or Russian life and wasn't able to adapt, who read the times and you know, put the times in sequence so he could do the crossword puzzle each day and follow the cricket. And then, uh, and Burgess, who had drunk himself to death after saying that the Soviet Union was like Glasgow on a Saturday night in the 19th century. And then um, Blake and McLean, who learned very good Russian. Blake said McLean's Russian was better than his own and who made a go of it in the Soviet Union, who really um, also maintained a kind of belief in communism with a human face that uh, when Gorbachev came along, Blake thought that might be it, who uh, found a, a second gear, which, which Philby was never able to do. I mean, I asked about that slightly weird afterlife, A, because of course, I suppose there are sort of functional equivalents these days, the Edward Snowdens of, the, of, of this world, or in a slightly different uh, formation, you know, there are other people who have clearly sort of gone Going back and forth across those, the, the, those borders. But it leads to a question that can come in from, from Mark Cornwall, actually a very good one. Why call the book The Happy Traitor? Well, at the end of our interview, Blake said to me, he said, well, you've heard my story, so what do you think? And um, I said, well, I'm a bit surprised because I'd expected a more tragic person. You know, I said, you've been through a lot and, um, you know, you left your family behind and everything. And he burst out laughing. He said, ah, oh, tragic, I am not. And I said, no, you're quite an amiable bloke. He said, yes, I'm a happy man. He said, which like literally in German means both happy and lucky. I'm a happy man or a lucky man. And uh, many will say I did not deserve my happiness, but there it is, I'm happy. And so that's why I call it happy traitor. And I think he was happy. I think he'd managed through psychological repression to, um, you know, to kind of get there. At that point, as Ricardo pointed out, he was happy because you said you were going to send him some pickled herring, but uh, you thought better of it. No, and it's, I don't think it's pickled. Um, I, I recommend Dutch herring. Any, anyone listening who's not done, it is wonderful. Um, but uh, that is what he wanted, yeah. That was the real reason we got you on today, to, to make the culinary recommendations. I'm looking at both my fellow panelists here. and They're, they're, they're I think, you know, getting a lot out of this. Uh, Helen, can I bring you back in for a second? I mean, any, any thoughts about what, what, what we've heard here? Yeah, I'm really interested in, in why Blake was actually finally caught. And I'm hoping the audience will be interested in this because, of course, he was the only one of that whole trunch of traitors that actually served partial jail sentence. Can you comment a bit? Because it's quite ambiguous. He, he might have actually slipped the net, mightn't he, Simon? Yeah, I mean, you know, as you say, none of the Cambridge Five ever, you know, um, did porridge. So he was very unlucky in a way. So he confesses during interrogation because he's offended that they think he did it because he was tortured. He says, no, no, I was an idealistic traitor. And then he foolishly confesses to special branches as well because, you know, just a confession to MI6 wouldn't have stood up in court. Yeah. And then they take him off for a country weekend, his three interrogators, to um, Harry Shergold's um, cottage in, I think, Surrey, and Blake and Shogol's mother-in-law make pancakes for everyone in the kitchen. It's all very jolly weekend. But meanwhile, MI6 is trying to work out, so what do we do with this bloke? And one option, which seems to have been discovered, discussed, is do we bump him off? You know, that mm. removes the problem. I think it was felt that bumping off a British citizen in Britain was going a bit far. And the other alternative is you let him do a fade, uh, as Philby was allowed to fade from Beirut into the Soviet Union. And... Um, Dick White, who's head of MI6 at that point, says, no, we're going to put him on trial. We're going to make an example of him. Where, and on trial, he gets 42 years. But yeah, I mean, this is, you know, it's remarkably harsh, given that um, Cairn Cross confessed multiple times, John Cairn Cross. Anthony Blunt confessed and was allowed to keep, remain keeper of the Queen's paintings. So uh, Blake was understandably a bit knocked that he was the only one who went down for this, or, albeit not very long, because getting out of British jails in the 1960s is not very difficult. Yeah, I was going to follow up about that. Can you comment on those that helped him basically break out? And do you have a sense of, of why they'd, they'd helped him? Do you think there was a sense that his sentence had been unfair? 
Yeah, well, when he escaped from jail, there was a lot of supposition that the KGB had uh, got him out, which wasn't true. And there was a conspiracy theory that MI6 had let him go, which also wasn't true. But it was felt that for a man who'd given, got 42 years in jail to escape from one was crowd so simply must involve a major intelligence agency. But no, it was three ex-cons. Uh, Sean Burke, who was an Irish prisoner who um, had been put in jail for uh, sending a bomb to a police officer who accused him of pedophilia. Uh, the police officer didn't die, but Blake, uh, Burke was sent down nonetheless. And two uh, peace activists, um, Pat Postle and Michael Randall, who had been mm. banged up in the scrubs for, sorry, I'm using a lot of prison terminology now because it's so beautiful with language. They'd been banged up for um, trespassing on a US military base. And in jail, these three meet Blake. Like everyone in Wormwood Scrubs, they love Blake. He's the most popular prisoner there. He teaches everyone German and Arabic and French. Mm. He writes letters to the authorities. And they feel it's, in, the peace activists feel it's wrong for a man to be given a 42 year jail sentence. That's just, just inhumane. And Burke um, just hates the British establishment. And so he likes the idea of getting Blake out of jail. And Burke also was an artist at heart. He was a writer and he saw from the beginning that freeing George Blake, the escape of George Blake was gonna be his great work, his great book, which he indeed wrote. The Spring of George Blake is a very good book. Mm. So um, Burke, who was, uh, you know, semi-educated, grown up very difficult circumstances in Ireland, he had inside him this book. So they, uh, it's not very difficult getting out of one with scrubs, a burglar inside breaks a window, Blake gets to the wall, he jumps down, um, burglars supplied a rope ladder made of knitting needles, but forgot to tie it to anything. And they hide in a bed sit in Shepherd's Bush for a bit and then in one of the peace access flats in Hampstead, and then they get out. So why these did, men did it was a mixture of um, moralism and then of kind of um, anti-British um, high spirits and art, art really, desire to create art. So the escape of George Blake, not just the writing, but the actual act, mm -hmm. was um, Burke's great creative act that he created in his lifetime. Performance art of the the most uh, kind of unusual sort, I uh, I guess. I see this comment come in from Peter uh, Peter, Peter Fisser saying Dutch raw herring recommended. I still think Simon should have sent the herrings. We we'll, could take that one up later as uh, uh, as uh, as well. Um, let me just throw back to actually. Let me, if I may, just throw in a question that's coming from Richard Bryant. Uh, and Richard's asking, thinking of George Blake's long years in that kind of ghost community, did the Soviet Union then Russia exploit or seek to gain politically? from him? And what, if anything, did Russian citizens know about him? No, the KGB really distrusted him. So whereas Philby, very soon after arriving in Moscow, gets a hello, Mr. Philby headline in his vestia, Blake's arrival is not heralded at all. And it's only a couple of years later that he does his coming out interview in his vestia. And the reason is that the KGB don't trust him because they think, how can a traitor who has got a 42 year jail sentence have escaped so easily from one with scrubs? MI6 must have done it. And they've sent him to us as a triple agent. And so uh, they were very, the KGB was very wary of Blake. It wouldn't give him any work. And they told him to rest, which he was not inclined to do. And mm -hmm. so it's only when McLean saves him with his job in Imamo that he gets something to do. So no, there was an enormous distrust uh, by the KGB of Blake. And also, you know, his, his spying usefulness was obviously gone because the Brits knew everything about him. So he had to cast about for a new role. And uh, he clearly found one, even if it was in a slightly dodgy think tank where he was dealing with, with, with Arabic texts. But, you know, I suppose there are worse fates, many of which were suffered by his, uh, his victims. Um, we're beginning to, to get to, I just want to check Helen, sorry, had I not cut you off there? Was there anything else that you wanted to, to put in at that point? No, that's, uh, that's all from myself. Thank you. Well, thank you so much there. What I'm going to do, if I may, is to hand over to Ricardo for perhaps a brief follow up comment of his own and then I think he's going we're coming just up to six o'clock in a few minutes so I will say thank you to everyone on my behalf and certainly thank you to, to Helen to Carol to, to Simon and let uh, Ricardo finish us uh, finish us off go ahead Ricardo. Rana I think this has been an extremely extremely rich conversation and it, it does justice to the many themes uh, uh, that the book touches upon it really speaks to very different audiences um, and and to to many uh, complex issues that uh, at the end of the day Simon doesn't resolve he just lets them simmer there uh, for our own edification in, in, in a very very rewarding way at least for me as as um, a reader so I would just uh, conclude by thanking um, St. Cross College uh, the master Carol Souter the technical team that made this possible um, Helen Fry, Rana Mitter, 
um, who organized the event, and most importantly, Simon. It's been a pleasure and a privilege, Simon, to talk to you about your book. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much. Virtual applause coming from all of us. Thank you all very much. And don't forget, you can still get a discounted copy if you go on the, the website and uh, link, uh, link there. But thank you all for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. Good night, everybody.